Hello, everyone. We're just going to take another minute to wait for uh, some people to log in that might be in the waiting room or something like that, and then, then we'll get started. Yeah, see a lot of uh, familiar people popping up in the chat there. Hello. And welcome. People, Singapore, Italy, Denver, Germany, all over the world here. Right. This is great. Okay, so uh, I think we'll get started now. It's 2.31. Um, so basically welcome to, uh, digital transitions, project lemonade webinar from captured exhibition using phase one medium format systems. I'm happy to announce that today we have with us, uh, for the presentation. And if you bear with me for a second, my slide is not advancing. Here we go. Uh, oops. It uh, jumped all the way ahead. Hold on one sec. Why is it doing this? Hey, Arnab. Here we go. It came back up. I didn't want to jump to enjoy the webinar. Okay. First, I'd like to introduce uh, David Shedlars, who will be our main presenter today. And then uh, he's the photographer and artist. And then we have Joseph Blazer of Blazing Editions. And uh, he is the uh, the printmaker. Uh, they're based in Rhode Island, and uh, each one of them will go more into their backgrounds and everything <clears throat> during their presentations. I myself am Lance Shad of Digital Transitions, and welcome you. Along with us uh, in the background, behind the scenes, and without these two, these webinars would not be possible. Is Kate Stone and Arnab Chatterjee. Um. For those of you who are not familiar with who Digital Transitions DT is, um, we are the largest and most diverse uh, phase one reseller partner in the world that provides advanced imaging solutions and services for a variety of uses across our four business divisions, which you'll see uh, pictured below. DT, commercial photo, which is uh, where we service our general photography clients, you know, our commercial clients, our fine artists, and uh, things like that. Um, through that uh, commercial division, we have training classes. Uh, we offer um, service and support as well as rentals. And uh, we have a team of experts here to answer any of your questions and help you through the process. Then we have our cultural heritage division of which uh, we manufacture and design and work with all of the, uh, the top tier institutions across the country and the world, such as uh, the Getty Museum, Library of Congress, National Archives, to name a few, to allow to provide systems, equipment, and services to allow them to archive our precious artifacts and objects and things like that for generations to come to uh, have to use for learning and other things. Then we have uh, Pixel Acuity, which is our service bureau division, of which um, everything I mentioned before about DT Cultural Heritage this is a service bureau arm of that, where they use all of our equipment to provide services for institutions such as uh, those I mentioned, and also corporate archives as well. And then we have our scientific and industrial division, where we work on specialty applications for the phase one systems. You know, why people work with digital transitions? You know, you know when you're looking at a medium format system, or any of the accessories that go along with it, it's an investment, not just a purchase. And we treat it that way. And, you know, we listen to you, your needs and all that to find the best solution for you. And then we're here to support you, not just today, right after the purchase, but into the future. You know, we build and value the relationships we've built with our clients over the years. And you become part of our family. Along with phase one, we also represent some of the other major product lines out there that complement it, such as Cambo, Arca Swiss, ISO, and to name a few. 
Um, you know, there's different ways to learn more about what Digital Transitions does or about the systems you'll hear about today. And that's via one-on-one -on -one consultation with one of us, our website. We also offer remote virtual demonstrations over the internet. So if you can't make it to us in person, which is very difficult these days, or attend one of our events, we can do this over the web for you. And we also do support that way as well. We also offer short-term rentals that we can ship anywhere in the US for you to test out the equipment or use on a job. And uh, there is a benefit to that because if you do like it after you rent it, we can apply a credit towards your future purchase. And then when it allows, we do in-person demonstrations at one of our locations, which we have two, one in New York and one in LA, or at events all over the country. A few more things before we get into the presentation, I pass it over to David, are over on the right-hand side of your window, you'll see a chat window, and that's where you can uh, interact with each other and also ask questions. And Arnob and myself will be answering some questions you know, via the chat window, and then there'll be some will hold until the end of each presenter's presentation to have that answer. Also, we'll be popping up, um, as you can see in a little window there, uh, little questions or polls, which the polls are very important for us to learn more about you guys and how we can tailor this presentation along the way to suit your needs the best and service you the best. So, Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to David Shedlars, who's you know been a longtime client of ours, and you know very happy to have him as a client and a friend. And uh, he's producing some excellent work, and I'm really excited to share it with you. So I'm going to pass it off off to David right now, and uh, let him take it over. I'm going to go off the camera, put David on, and uh, here you go. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Lance, <clears throat> and the and the digital transition team for kind of pulling this uh, all together, and for the opportunity to talk about my work, uh, especially over the course of the last couple of years, as well as Joseph sharing uh, this presentation with me in terms of the excellent work you did in printing in large size uh, a number of uh, my images from New Zealand. I mean, lastly, welcome everybody to joining the discussion today. We'll try and keep it <clears throat> to the point where it kind of outlines some of my key experiences over the course of the last three years. The agenda I have is to quickly go through a biography, to talk to you a little about <clears throat> my evolution from Leica to phase one, and then to give you some real life examples uh, photos taken around the world over the course of the last three to four years and why I chose the system I chose and all the help I got in terms of pursuing various key project work. So <clears throat> at an early age, I had a affinity for art, much to the chagrin of my father after I ended up painting all of my bedroom walls with landscapes. I then from there went off to college and pursued a fine arts major and <clears throat> ultimately an economics major. Uh, the reason I pursued an economics major is because I think my father was concerned about how he was going to make a living and whether he was going to need to support me for the rest of my life. Uh, from there, with the economics major, I went on to the corporate world for an extended period of time, but I never gave up art or photography. And for an extended period of time, when I had the opportunity, I went out shooting. Over the course of about the last four to five years, I would guess photography has become somewhat of a profession. And so in that regard, in terms of my evolution, I've kind of moved from the Leica M system. For those of you who don't know what a Leica M system looks like, this is an M camera. <clears throat> and I moved to the IQ3 series, a little bit bigger, as you can see. And we'll kind of go through some of the benefits and the challenges in terms of moving from <clears throat> a rangefinder to a medium format camera, both in terms of the pros and cons. In terms of the 
equipment that I've used over time. I've used both the XF system in various iterations, as well as the various technical cameras, including the latest XT system. So I guess the basic question is why move from a Leica system into medium format? Let me kind of start out by saying the Leica system is a pretty good system. <clears throat> this has fabulous uh, lens quality and the images that are produced are quite good at relatively small sizes. And therein lies some of the challenges I faced when I went from doing it as a hobby to doing it as a profession with an objective in terms of producing prints on an ongoing basis. So I've listed some of the <clears throat> advantages over the phase one system. Clearly, superior image quality and size. And that's critically important, not only in terms of print size, but also in terms of the ability to do post-production work. Exceptional dynamic range, which I'll try and highlight in a few images as examples. Expanding in-camera flexibility, the one that you'll see in this presentation is frame averaging, which afforded a number of <clears throat> critical opportunities for me. But on the other hand, there's some challenges. This by no means is an inconspicuous camera, especially when you're shooting portraiture work on the street. <clears throat> there are also some other disadvantages, especially relative to DSLRs like single focal point. There's no image stabilization. And for that reason, there's a need, in some cases, in a pretty dramatic way, to change your shooting style. And there are pluses and minuses behind that. Number one, you gotta slow down. Number two, especially if you're going to shoot portraiture work on the street, you're gonna to have to do so, and at the same time, create a relationship with the person that you're photographing. There's no way you're going to stick that big camera in somebody's face without having, without having had a dialogue and establishing somewhat of a relationship over time. So there's an investment in terms of relearning your shooting style, <clears throat> which I think, in my particular case, I think it served both the composition and the quality of the image quite well. These are two images that I ended up taking in Cuba. And I guess that was the start of my <clears throat> opportunity to kind of move from the Leica to the phase one system. The one on the bottom is an excellent photograph. It was taken with the Leica M camera system. Unfortunately, one of my colleagues decided to put his head into half the frame. And as a result, I had to crop this frame pretty dramatically. I didn't have another opportunity to shoot this particular shot because the reflection you see of the trumpet disappeared within almost a minute. As a result, there were severe limitations with regard to the quality of the print and also the size flexibility at the same time. On the same trip, I ended up picking up the phase one system, an IQ3, at this particular point in time and was able to take a shot on the streets of this individual. As you'll see, <clears throat> there were little limitations in terms of the quality of this image. And I really had tremendous flexibility in terms of the size, but just as importantly, the level of detail, the tone, the texture of this image is quite remarkable. And in part, that's a product of the capability of the camera system. These are two additional shots I shot in Cuba. <clears throat> I love the way that this partic these particular individuals decided to pose for the picture. I also love the color representation that was produced by the camera. The one on the left, which we call the cross, is quite amazing. <clears throat> he was a construction worker uh, who uh, decided to stop and allow me the luxury of taking his picture. And he stopped right smack in the middle of a color composition, which was just perfect. He was, he's the one who chose to put his arm through his cross in order to accentuate that particular cross. 
but it shows the need once again with these systems in order to take advantage of the great capability to slow yourself down, to step back and take the opportunity to develop somewhat of a relationship with these individuals. The <clears throat> gentleman with the hat provides fabulous detail and sharpness. I don't know whether you can get an appreciation for this, but when it was printed, you can actually see the light coming through his hat at various locations. Somewhere between Havana and Trinidad, we took the opportunity to take this system out on a farm. And this is a father and son of a farming establishment in that particular location. Just take a look at the quality of the eye capture in this particular shot. <clears throat> in my mind, it's quite amazing. And again, an attribution to the capabilities of the system. It's also, you see the farmer on the right-hand side, and he kind of chased me around for most of the day. His objective was for me to take a picture of him in front of his most prized field showing pride and <clears throat> what he was doing uh, for a living. Both of these were taken handheld. The one on the right was taken at an f-stop to 6.3, the one on the left at 4.5, and they were both taken with a 28 millimeter lens. So I don't know how many of you have had an opportunity to shoot portraiture work with a 28 millimeter lens. But let me highlight to you, you need to get very, very close to the subject in order to do it properly. So here's an example of exactly that. This is how close you have to get to the subject in order to do this properly. There's no way you're going to do this without establishing a relationship with the individuals for them feeling comfortable with you and waiting them out in order to get a natural pose. And on the left-hand side, you can see <clears throat> how proud these individuals are. You can see the intimate relationship that they have between themselves. And once again, they set themselves up with a background which further facilitates the melding of their relationships. So that was kind of the start of my experience with the phase system. It was on a POTUS workshop, which at that particular point in time, was being sponsored by phase one so that people could really get some first-hand experience with the system. And kind of coming at that, um, I was intrigued in terms of where else could I apply the system, in other ses settings, in other genders, in other locations around the world. Another opportunity taken was to take this system out to China in order to, this particular case, to take some nightscapes, some landscapes, and some what I call ridiculous scapes, <clears throat> like the one on the right. Uh, I guess this points to the need to set up early. And on the left-hand side, you see a picture of the Nampu Bridge. This is typical traffic in China in that particular location. Now, the key to all of this was getting up in the right location to be able to take this photograph. The only way you could have possibly taken this photograph is getting to the top of a building within Shanghai. And in that regard, you have to, number one, have somebody with you who's capable of kind of negotiating a capability to do so. I kind of wonder today whether or not you'd really have the opportunity to get up on the top of the buildings for various reasons and take these shots and whether or not there will be an abundance of opportunity going forward. On the right hand side is my better half Sandy and myself on a tripod in the middle of the street. Here we wanted to take the opportunity to really get the light trails and the traffic going in numerous directions. If you kind of look at very carefully the left hand side of this picture you will see a policeman. And he, on numerous occasions, tried to get us out of that particular location. He finally figured out we were Americans, 
and he decided, well, I'm just going to give up. They're crazy. We'll leave them in that particular spot. But with those vantage points and with a, with a phase one system, in this particular case, an IQ3, 100 megapixel, trichromatic back, this is what you end up with. <clears throat> it's quite exceptional in terms of the quality of the image we actually produce. Both of these were long exposures. In the case of the left-hand side on the Nampu Bridge, if you're wondering what is the, what makes up the white and the red, the white are the headlights of the cars, and the red are the taillights. And then you see on the right-hand side the light trails of the traffic as it came from so many different directions during this shot. These were both taken with a 28 millimeter <clears throat> lens, uh, f-stop 4.5, and one, uh, the one on the right was 60 seconds, and the one on the left was 30 seconds. Again, <clears throat> rate utilization of a relatively old Schneider Kruznak lens, a 28, but a magnificent lens in terms of carrying out nightscapes of this quality. <clears throat> Talking about printing at size, we really wanted to test the system in terms of its capabilities in this regard. And this is a picture of the Hong Kong Harbor at night. Again, shot with the IQ3, 100 megapixel and trichromatic back. By the way, I consider that even today to be the best back that phase one has for color rendition. The other ones are pretty good, but this is probably the best that I've experienced. In this particular uh, capture, uh, this was a stitch of two images, and we benefited in terms of the quality of this image on two fronts. One, very rarely, there absolutely was little, if any, wind. And so light trails that you see are quite significant and distinct as a result of that. The other key factor was the fact we didn't have any smog. <clears throat> and that, if those of you have been to Hong Kong on a number of occasions, know how ex exceptional that is. This was shot at a base ISO of 35, in a both 20 seconds, and it was shot at F14. We kind of moved on in terms of showing some of the capabilities of the system. And in this particular project, the objective was to shoot in black and white and to really test the capability of the achromatic or the monochromatic system that phase have. That's the one without the color or Bayer uh, filter in it. And so <clears throat> these are three examples of photos that were taken with that in mind. <clears throat> Clearly, what I wanted to capture was the tone, the texture, the light, and the significant detail. I must tell you all of that was facilitated by the use, use of the phase one achromatic system. We ended up printing these along with a number of others, utilizing an age old process of printing with inert metals known as palladium uh, platinum prints. And in order to do so properly and take full advantage of that printing capability you needed the level of quality of the print and the file which came out of the phase one system. One of my mentors told me, listen, never delete things in camera. Always take it back into the computer and see what you had afterwards. And that was a lesson learned with regard to the image on the right. When I shot that image, I was looking into a fairly dark dark scene. And for those of you who have shot with the phase one system, I think you're aware of the fact that the phase one system at times has some difficulty accommodating the lack of light. This clearly was the case. This is an individual that I spent a fair amount of time trying to gain a relationship with. The stare <clears throat> into the camera is quite exceptional. And it's not till I got back and utilized the Capture One post-production process that I really have an appreciation 
for what I had. This is what that file produced. And once again, <clears throat> given how dark the situation was, given the very low light that I had to work with, given the fact this was taken handheld, once again, with not one of the, not the most nimble of camera systems, <clears throat> the camera system produ uh, performed extremely well. Without the destruction of the color, the soft highlights, the, st <clears throat> the steady glares of the subject, I believe really come through. And we recently printed this in a platinum, and I must say the image is somewhat haunting, to say the least. We also wanted to kind of test the system where there were challenges as it relates and opportunities as it relates to color. As you see on the uh, left-hand side, <clears throat> this particular image, I really wanted to represent the tone on tone, which was implicit in the opportunity. I also wanted to capture the shadow work, which was coming through the awning, straight through to the wall on the other side, <clears throat> and also capture the fine detail at the same time. We ended up producing this particular print 48 by 36. And the level of detail, the level of texture, the level of tone, which has come through utilizing this particular file, once again, is fabulous. We also wanted to kind of test the system in terms of an opportunity involving an extreme color rendition and how true with the color B to the actual capture. We take a look at this side. I think you can see number one, the result, but also the performance of the camera at the same time. There's great color, there's great structure, there's strong detail, and this is tack sharp. So <clears throat> once again, I think the color rendition capable of achieving with this particular cam camera system is quite remarkable. Also on the left, you can see once again how close you need to get in order to take a proper picture. Again, pointing to the need to have a shooting style which accommodates an interchange and a relationship with the folks that you're photographing. We then went off to Nepal. In this particular case, in order to at least start to put the new technical camera to work in that part of the world. For those of you who haven't seen the technical camera, this is the technical camera. It's with the phase one back on it at the same time. It's very compact and allows for ease of use and has a streamlined workflow and it is much more efficient and particularly in focusing relative to the old systems. This is the old Cambo system. And I don't know whether you can see it, but the focal point is city focus point is sitting out here. So leaning over a cliff, trying to figure out what the F stop should be, playing around with the focal point on the front of that without falling off the cliff at times can be a challenge. So the XT system in terms of its benefits, I think <clears throat> significantly enhanced at least my workflow capability and my level of comfort in terms of taking a number of these shots. This is a particular shot that was taken in Nepal. Uh, it was taken on the side of a mountain, very narrow road. I had probably about a foot to set up the system. And also I had to deal with ongoing traffic on an ongoing basis and not fall off the cliff at the same time. <clears throat> the capabilities and attributes of the new XT system, I think afforded the opportunity to do this safely. Also took the opportunity, thanks to Lance and the digital transition folks, to put the new prototype 138 <clears throat> rodent stock lens to a test. 
And this is a great uh, lens. It's still in a prototype at this point in time. But on the left-hand side, you can see the Himalaya Mountains in the background. The Himalaya Mountains, I would guess, was, were about 25 miles off of where I was shooting. And that's the quality of shot we were able to get with this XT system and with the new 138 millimeter lens. The ability uh, to on the back of the camera to adjust the f-stop, the ISO, the shutter speeds, and the easier focus is a real benefit to trying to take photographs in these types of locations with these types of challenges. In terms of the XD with filter systems, I think uh, it's important to recognize there's a lot you can do with the technical cameras, with frame averaging, and uh, with the uh, systems that you have in place. But probably the best combination is to combine all those capabilities when necessary with a good solid filter system. I ended up using the Wine Country filter system for many of these uh, shots. You can see in this shot, despite the fact it was hazy, there was a challenge in that the foreground was very dark. And at the same time, you're getting the sun setting on the right hand side. And so being able to utilize effectively with the new XD camera, the wine country filter system facilitated my ability to accommodate the great difference between the foreground and the background. <clears throat> the thing we're going to talk about uh, a little later with Joseph and Blazing Transitions is the trip we ended up taking uh, to New Zealand and the opportunity taken to take a tremendous number of landscape shots uh, during that trip. I'd like to highlight that this trip and the quality of the shots I was able to get would not have been possible without the assistance of Paul Reefer. Paul himself is an exceptional landscape, cityscape photographer. If you haven't seen his work, I suggest you take the opportunity to go online and take a look at his just fabulous work. He's also a phase one ambassador a friend and a mentor, and somebody who has been very generous with his time. Paul knows New Zealand like the back of his hand. And I'd say for those who are looking to go to remote locations around the world, which you haven't been to previously, you can do all the planning in the world. And we did a fair amount of that in terms of where we wanted to shoot, how we wanted to shoot. But having someone like Paul in a bespoken uh, opportunity in terms of a workshop to go with you who's been there previously who knows some of the, some of the uh, challenges in terms of how you go about shooting in these particular environments is invaluable we also got the opportunity probably to, to drive for about 400 miles around the south island of new zealand at the same time and so i'd like to credit paul with uh, the great support he extended to me in terms of taking these photos. During this trip, we took the opportunity to really utilize the frame averaging to a maximum extent. We uh, didn't have it uh, available to us at that particular point in time, the XT system. So we used the uh, Cambo system, which is a fine system. It's just more difficult and time consuming in terms of being able to utilize that effectively. And we also use the Wine Country camera filter system at the same time. <clears throat> this uh, is an example of a, one of the photos we took and some of the advantages we had in terms of the nature of the landscape in New Zealand. I'll tell you, one of the greatest challenges I had personally with this is actually getting around to shoot it. On many occasions, I just sat there and stood <clears throat> and looked at these particular scenes for an extended period of time without taking a shot. This particular image was taken 
in a two panel, printed in a two panel, 48 by 48, both of them. <clears throat> over, I guess 48 by 48 and 48 by 96 overall. Again, we really kind of tested the ability to print these particular images at size. This was shot with the IQ4 150 at an ISO of 50, which is the lowest, 1 60th of a second, an F11, probably with about a two and a half minute frame average. So this is the type of scene you can come upon by just traveling around the South Island of New Zealand and just stopping when you see something exceptional and taking the photo. Also, I had the opportunity to take a number of other shots. I think mo um, so those of you that have been to New Zealand will recognize the one on the left. That's the Wanaka tree. And this was an opportunity to really capture the calm and tranquil nature of the image and also the reflection, which is quite remarkable. Unfortunately, no one's going to be able to take this image again. This uh, tree was vandalized, I guess, six or 12 months ago by someone for some ungodly and unexplainable reason. But again, <clears throat> this is an image where we took full advantage of the frame averaging technique. What's remarkable in terms of the results of this particular image is that tree, when you look at it on the print, is tack sharp. And that's remarkable <clears throat> given the fact that if there was any wind while frame averaging for the amount of time that we framed average, anywhere from about two and a half to three minutes, that would not have been a tack sharp image. But I guess we just lucked out. The other one is one uh, shot of one of the Meraki boulders. Uh, <clears throat> this once again was taken with frame averaging. And again, <clears throat> was tack sharp, which I'll show you in a moment in terms of the optimal, optimal image. They're both shot at ISOs approximately 50. Uh, <clears throat> the one on the left for 1 25th of a second frame average for, I guess, two and a half minutes. And the other one at a third of a second, both at F11, by the way. This, when I pulled this up in the camera and I exposed it, <clears throat> I couldn't believe the extent to which you could get the tone, the texture, <clears throat> the structure on the rock and have just an absolutely calm and crystal clear pool sitting in the middle of the rock. This is uh, a lighthouse uh, that we ended up taking in New Zealand as well. well it's a perfect opportunity to kind of be flexible in terms of your plans. Uh, we started out very early in the morning, about 3 a.m., to get to this lighthouse. We climbed up to the spot uh, with the head headlamps on in order to take the opportunity to shoot the stars above the uh, lighthouse. Well, you can see what transpired. You're not going to get too many star shots with that level of cloud structure. In fact, we spent most of the morning in the car. We went back and forth to try and capture the lighthouse with the storm on a number of occasions. We put the system somewhat at risk <clears throat> by doing so. But nonetheless, we were able to get probably a two-minute opportunity to take this shot of the lighthouse with the storm before it started to rain again. And again, <laughs> exceptional performance in a relatively low light situation. This is shot uh, in uh, St. Clair Beach in New Zealand. Uh, when I looked at this, I found this to be a serene and mystical site. The problem was we ended up trying to shoot this with the tech camera with the 138 millimeter lens. For those of you who have seen the lens profile, it is a long lens. And so it's not very good in a high wind situation. Well, one of Paul Reefer's many services to you in a bespoken 
<clears throat> workshop is he acts as a wind guard. And that's Paul kind of trying to cut off the wind from the lens. And we were successful getting to the point where the 138 millimeter rodenstock lens did not prove to be a challenge. And actually the shot came out extremely well. This is shot when we attempted to take three times. It's the sunrise over Good Shepherd at Lake Tikapu. Uh, we wanted to take advantage of the sunrise and unusual colors at sunrise. We were unsuccessful on two occasions. On the third occasion, and the weather forecast was pretty miserable in terms of going out to this particular site. Nonetheless, we went out there and the possibility that it would clear up and it did. So you never know what's going to happen in terms of these particular sites, especially in a, a location like New Zealand. The sunrise was just magnificent. And again, <clears throat> concerned that people wouldn't think this was the actual color, we ended up taking an iPhone shot, which we have as backup to this particular photograph. We also lucked out because as you can see, if you focus in on the church itself, those lights are purely coming from the ray of sun from the sunrise in through the windows of the church. There are no lights on in that church. So it's remarkable in terms of the ability to pick up the sunrise, uh, sunrise on the landscape, but at the same time also pick it up straight through the windows of the church. We also uh, took the opportunity to put the achromatic or the monochromatic back at pace at this particular location. Uh, this was shot on, 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 in the morning. Uh, Tasman uh, Glacier is what you're looking at. Uh, this was an opportunity for us to, climb, to march about two miles in, which wasn't that difficult with the system, but then to come down the glacier cliff. <clears throat> at night with headlamps when it was icy and when it was extremely cold. In this particular instance, Paul led the trail and he practiced his diving capability, falling into the rocks at one, loca at one location. And I almost gave up going down the cliff as a result of that. But <clears throat> I think this points to the portability of the uh, tech, uh, tech systems being relatively small and light. And we were able to get down to the, uh, on the glacier edge and take this shot and be able to get the sunrise at the same time. We also wanted to take the opportunity, so we went another time to take this <clears throat> in color. And even in color, I think it's even more dramatic in terms of really capturing the nature of the site, the glacial water, the various colors, and on the mountain to the left, this Cook Mountain, you can actually see the sunrise starting to come up on that particular point. That's the real color, folks. <clears throat> and that comes from a combination of the light source, but also the clear glacial water at the same time. So I think this hopefully has highlighted to you some of the capabilities of the system, some of the evolution of the system in terms of me utilizing it at various sites around the world. I must say, uh, initially I had a great affinity for doing portraiture work. I think the nature of my portraiture work was facilitated quite significantly in terms of the capability of this uh, camera system. It did caused me to have to change pretty significantly my workflow and my approach to the subjects, I think for the better, especially in this day and age. And it also got me to the point where I took up with Ernest the opportunity to take landscapes and cityscapes at the same time. And I think the system performed extremely well across all of those opportunities, all of those challenges, and all of those dimensions. And so with that, I guess I'd hand this back to uh, the folks.
folks at DT in terms of how they'd like to proceed ahead. Yeah, so um, what we're going to do, uh, it's Lance again. I'm not sure if my camera's coming up. Let me see here. A few questions that people have for you, David. Then we're going to pass it along. Uh, Joseph, collaboration. Uh, Joseph of uh, them working with. Um, so let's start with the first question. And a great presentation. Thank you, David. Um, basically, the first question was, where in India were you um, for those portraits? Yeah, a lot of them were in uh, New Delhi, in Jodhpur, uh, in Mumbai. So we were we had a number of uh, sites in okay. India. That sounds to, great. Uh, take those shots. But, uh, Next question, yeah, which comes from Jay. Can you please discuss some of the details on how you compare working with the Cambo sixteen hundred versus DXT? Some of the things you touched on, maybe you can elaborate. Sure. So if I contrast the two. Listen, if I was just starting out in a technical system and wanted to use the capabilities of uh, the phase one systems, it definitely would be the, with the XT system. And that's because the workflow is a lot easier. You're able to access on the back of the camera all of the settings. You can access the f-stop, the ISO. Uh, and so you can actually see as you're doing that and you're changing it, you can see how the image is changing on the back of the camera. Also, in, <clears throat> on the uh, camera, it's a lot easier, at least was for me, to focus the technical rodent stock lens. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that's difficult to start with. It's not easy, but it's made easier with the XT system. If you take a look at the Cambo system, I think it's important to understand there are a number of advantages and disadvantages. In this particular uh, system, with this particular lens, I would say <clears throat> that the shifting capability of the Cambo system is greater than the x -Tip. Also understand that this is not only a shifting lens, this is a tilt lens as well. So I can imagine for people who are way well trained utilizing these particular like types of systems and have as their subject matter architectural shots, they may might mm -hmm. be willing to make the investment in time and effort and understanding in terms of how to utilize the Cambo system. But for <clears throat> the rank and file, they're going to utilize it for landscapes, for cityscapes, for those types of opportunities if you're just starting out. The XD system, at least for my consumption, given the ability to interact with the back of the camera, set the f-stop, not have to reach to the front of the lens to set the f-stop, be able to see the ISO and the shutter speed and see how the image Yeah, and the beauty is in um, terms of the, light. the Cambo really and the XT share the same lens balance. So out. it's true what um, David had mentioned that, you know, the Cambo does offer larger movements right. um, than the XT, which may be uh, required. Or like in David's case, he started with the Cambo and then the XT came out, and he didn't have to reinvest in all the lenses again because the manual lenses from his Cambo are still compatible with the mount on the XT in the manual manual mode. Coming soon, um, he'll be able to control his X shutter lenses, which are the native XT lenses, on his Cambo system via just a little cable. So it'll give him the best of both worlds. Um, by having an investment in the Cambo architecture. Thanks, David. Hope that answers your question, Jay. Okay, next question is, let's see here. Um, what do you consider, uh, the, how's the battery life on the XT, you know, or the IQ4 and the XT? Right. Yeah, environmental uh, conditions really is it hot? Uh, play is a toll it on the batteries. Uh, if it it's hot? really cold, you know, they'll, they'll deplete quickly. But as far as battery, man battery management goes, it's pretty good, right? 
Right. And they're, they're relatively small and inexpensive. Just bring a lot of batteries in your pocket. That's all. They're relatively small and easy to, to change them on the fly. But listen, they don't have the best battery life. If you're used to a DSLR uh, battery life uh, structure, you're not going to get that with these types of uh, systems. Although, <clears throat> Right. Having to carry on, um, uh, let's carry see. A Next question, not a couple similar batteries. ones. Uh, would be, um, if you had one lens to carry for the XT, which one would it be? It's a tough choice, right? Exactly. What are you shooting? Um, let's say landscape, and then we'll, you know, what are you shooting? Yeah, and, that, and that's one of the finest so wide angle lenses. Really, out there an on the expansive market. landscape. So like 32. Probably a 32. On the other hand, <clears throat> I had a affinity for a lot of these shots to kind of keep it intimate. Right. And as a result, uh, I ended up um, using let's a see. We have room time for like two more questions, and and then at the very end, yes. Plants? Yeah, two more, and then at the very end, oh, we have more uh, time. Just, okay, yeah, you um, I just want to make sure. We will uh, we... ask the rest of them. The, how about, um, we did battery life. Well, let's see, one more. Have you used a dual exposed feature? Not yet. Yeah. That came out after your last trip that you went out. I haven't. Uh, right, yeah. it, it's a great feature, it. adds more dynamic range. It basically, for those who aren't familiar with dual exposure, is it's a feature in the IQ4 150, which takes a single exposure and then exposure right after, and uh, provides you with about 18 stops of dynamic range to use within uh, Capture One's tools. And it's pretty incredible. Yeah, when, when I take a look at that opportunity, <clears throat> I think number one, recognize the fair amount of dynamic range sitting in uh, the camera to start with. You've got to be careful uh, with those type of situations in terms of movement uh, <clears throat> and, may, and at the same time kind of not ending up with a bunch of noise in whatever you're getting. So <clears throat> you got to make sure that you kind of assess right. the and, environment. Um, and if you read, we have a great article, which, which uh, we'll put up a link uh, shortly to on our website where we did a deep dive into Dual Exposure Plus to learn more about that. And David, I just want to thank you for your time and sharing your, your wonderful work. And at the end, if we have some more time, we'll bring some more questions out. But right now, what I'd like to sure. do is introduce uh, Joseph Blazer of Blazing Editions um, to go and talk about the collaboration that he has with David and other artists and um, their whole fine art printmaking operation. So here's Joseph. Thanks, Lance. I appreciate it. Um, also, want to thank the. Did, Please. Uh, yeah. How, how about this? I'm gonna just take out my PowerPoint here. Perfect. Transitions. Appreciate uh, the collaboration and uh, putting me together with David and David, thank you for uh, sharing your beautiful work. It makes uh, my job as a fine art printmaker a lot easier when uh, you get quality files sent to you. Um, so guys, my name is Joseph Blazer. I'm uh, based in Rhode Island. Uh, I run a company called Blazing Editions. We are a fine art printmaking company. Um, my father started the company about 20 years ago and we've been expanding ever since uh, working with artists who are both painters and photographers. Um, oh, let me get you guys to the right presentation. So, oh, got you all the way up to the wrong slide here. Okay. So just to give you a, a quick rundown, um, we started back in 96 as a company, a family owned and operated. Um, we started in my parents' basement. My father started the company with uh, famous photographers like Jay Maisel and Joel Meyerowitz. 
um, back in the 90s, and then we've moved forward with a number of other, um, not only established photographers, amateur photographers, working with galleries, uh, museums, um, and, and, and of the sorts. So anyways, to give you a quick overview, we are first and foremost a fine art printmaker. Uh, we also represent a handful of artists. Right now we're doing a, uh, representing David's work in our YJ Contemporary Retail Gallery, which is here in Rhode Island. It's actually, I'm in it right now, and I'll give you guys a quick little tour of the space. Lighting's not good on this video camera, but anyways, yeah, we have everything up right now. Um, we have uh, the ability to have people come in during the pandemic for appointment only, um, and then we also have an interactive gallery uh, on our website, which I'm sure we'll send out a link to everybody to, uh, to explore after this uh, presentation. Um, so we, we also do a lot of consulting too with uh, artists, uh, photographers who are just starting out, uh, trying to figure out how they can market their artwork uh, tangibly, not just uh, digitally online. Um, we also do a lot of art deliveries and installations uh, local in our region uh, from New York City to Boston area. Um, and then we also do a lot of drop shipping around the country and also as uh, international. Uh, some of the printing services that we offer, um, we like to consider ourselves a full service printmaker. So we do uh, fine art printmaking, canvas, watercolor paper, for all photographic uh, papers, as well as dye sublimated aluminum. We do digital capturing and archiving of original paintings for artists. Uh, all, we do full framing, custom framing, uh, delivery and installation, as I mentioned before. And who we really work with, primarily, number one, we're working directly with the artists. So someone like David um, or a painter, a uh, photographer, you name it, if they have something that they're looking to reproduce, uh, we're happy to help work with them. And then on a second tier, we're working with a lot of galleries. Um, a lot of galleries work directly with us to get artwork uh, from photographers. So we've been acting as a source too for galleries to find new artists um, from some of our printing clients. We also work with art consultants, designers, and we work with art fairs right now. They're obviously postponed or canceled, but hopefully back in 2021, they'll come back uh, online. And then we do work with corporate art companies who do public installations um, out in large outfittings like that. And guys, if you have any questions, feel free to um, shoot those out. I'm, I'm happy to answer any that you have. Um, so printmaking, was, we really focus on a lot of photographic papers, watercolor papers, and the biggest thing that we've been getting into now is dye sublimation onto aluminum. Uh, that's what we did, all of David's work, what you see behind me right here, where you can actually go up and touch it. There's no glass or acrylic over top of this. Uh, I don't have to worry about scratching it. I can clean this with a microfiber rag and some Windex. We actually use rubbing alcohol here to clean uh, fingerprints off before we ship. Um, we also do face mounting onto acrylic, uh, and then we also do canvas. Primarily, we like to only use that for painters only because that's a substrate that they paint on, and we like to reproduce on that. We like to keep photographers on other mediums um, other than canvas because uh, it technically wasn't really uh, meant for photography. Uh, so I have a question here. What are the benefits of dye sub? So actually, I believe that is the next slide. I'll, I'll answer that question shortly after this slide. So dye sublimation is a heat transfer process. So what we're doing is we're printing on transfer paper through an inkjet printer, uh, but we're using, dye, we're using dyes rather than pigments. And we're sticking in a heat press, the transfer paper onto a sheet of pretreated aluminum. And through that process, when it's in the heat press, uh, it goes, the dyes go from a solid into a gas, back into a solid, skipping the liquid state. Uh, this is something that we probably all learned in chemistry class. Um, and it's something I actually remember the process and now we do it, you know, something I learned in high school, we actually do uh, here in business. Um, the nice thing about aluminum, you can use multiple surfaces. So right here is actually the matte finish. I have a lot of natural light coming into the gallery space right now. Um, it's about 3.30 and the sun's actually coming through our big uh, windows over here. Uh, we really like the matte finish because it really takes away some of that glare. Let me just show you some of these big windows that you have coming in right now. 
Um, and we also have semi-gloss and gloss. So if you're looking for big impacts, you can go on a gloss finish. That will emulate something like acrylic or glass. And so here are the benefits of sublimation. Uh, one thing that has come to light, especially when you're doing public installations, is making sure the artwork is fire retardant. So that way it doesn't, in case of a fire, it doesn't enhance the fire. It actually do, uh, doesn't burn. So the really nice thing about the aluminum, we heat it uh, between 350 and 400 degrees just to get the sublimation to occur. And so what's really nice is that um, you could put a lighter uh, flame, an open flame to this, and it will not catch on fire. Uh, it's also comprised of 90% recycled aluminum. It's also extremely lightweight because it is aluminum and aluminum is one of the lighter um, metals out there. So a 40 by 60 weighs only 13 pounds. I get a lot of questions from people asking how do I hang the artwork? And I always say you, you don't have to go crazy. You don't have to put in these crazy cleats. If you want to, you can. Um, but a lot of times you can just put a, sc a screw right into drywall and hang it off that. Um, we're able to go large format, so the largest size is four feet by eight feet or 48 inches by 96. It's a rigid substrate, so we have the ability to make custom shapes and sizes. Uh, we do a lot of circular artwork these days as well. Um, and the, we have the, also the biggest thing I would say with uh, aluminum dye sublimation is the effect that uh, the environmental protection. So there is a UV coating on it. Um, it has been tested um, for archivability. Right now it's between 65 years and 75 plus years. There's two uh, independent tests that have been uh, occurred, one by Henry Wilhelm and then, Rod and then the Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, and then the biggest thing that I've seen, uh, so growing up in this business, we have traditionally uh, printed on papers and mounted and put them under, under glass. And a good example is we have a beautiful Milton Green here in our studio, and it's mount, it beautifully mounted watercolor paper, but it's been 20 years, and uh, the color is still the same, but uh, the, the paper has actually rippled due to humidity over time. So we're in Rhode Island where it's dry in the winter, but very humid in the summer. And over time, even with a uh, temperature controlled atmosphere, uh, you can get humidity in there and it starts rippling the paper. So you might have a piece, uh, a beautiful piece where the color is accurate and it has not aged at all, but the mounting in the paper has rippled and the unfortunate only thing you can do is replace it, you can't repair it. So one thing that's really nice about the aluminum as humidity is not going to affect it, uh, affect the quality of it over time. We actually use um, the dye sublimation onto aluminum for signage outside, uh, which it can be used for. Um, the, obviously, like any other substrate, when you go outside, you are limiting the lifespan. But the really nice thing is that um, rain and humidity is not going to affect it and it's not going to start rippling over time. And the biggest benefit that we see too, especially when you're shipping artwork around the country, large artwork, um, is the fact that we don't need to use glass. Um, glass has always been a tricky thing to ship uh, around the country and around the world. So the ability to ship artwork like this and not have to worry about it being shattered or anything like that is a real benefit to this substrate. So when we're collaborating with someone, say David, uh, we really go into the steps of proofing. And with any fine art printmaker, uh, the beginning steps are always the most challenging and the most time consuming. Um, we like to always make sure that we have calibrated monitors. We have them here. We also uh, encourage our uh, clients to have them as well, if uh, possible. Uh, we always like to encourage downloading our ICC profiles, which can be found right on our website, or we can always send them to you directly. That way you get a better idea of how things, uh, your image is going to translate onto a tangible, um, tangible substrate. And one of the other things that we like to do is do resolution checks. Uh, regardless, we have some clients who don't even like to proof their images. They just like to go direct to print. But one thing we always do is resolution checks. And one thing um, what's really nice about David's work and working with a company like Digital Transitions in phase one is the fact that I've had very seldom times have I ever had to tell someone who uses a phase one that we can't go as large as they requested. Uh, a lot of my days are spent with having clients who use uh, a camera-based that body that just can't handle the size they want to go. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. 
And one thing that we're really big on too is if the artist or the photographer has a target, which means a tangible uh, proof to send us, we always encourage sending that to us ahead of time if they have their own small desktop printer that they've, they've approved color on. If not, what we'll do is we'll send initial proofs out ahead of time. Uh, the biggest thing for us is we really want to have um, to be on the same page with color before we go to a large print. Uh, because no matter how you cut it, it is an expensive process. So to be able to make sure we have an insurance policy that we're on the same page on color is really important to us. Um, one thing we do with, we do a lot of digital uh, proofs. We mainly do that for resolution, but our biggest way of uh, getting exact color is sending a tangible proof on that specific substrate. So if we're producing on dye sublimated aluminum, uh, the final print, we like to send a proof, a section of that smaller, just to make sure we're on the same page. So one thing I like to talk about, and one thing we did with David here, um, and, and David, if there's any chance you can get back on too with your microphone and video, I'd love to talk to you about this, um, is our collaboration with the artists. So when we, David and I first started working together on this um, project, um, he sent me a, a, a f about, about 15 files and we were curating. Hey, David. Um, and so this was an image, Lighthouse at Nugget Point, that David sent me two uh, files of and wanted to get my expertise on this. The one on the left that you see is a little more punched up and actually it looks really, really nice on screen. But um, a company like us, we have the knowledge base of understanding that going to a tangible large print uh, we want to make sure that the piece uh, really exempl it really looks fantastic li uh, live and in person. On screen, the one on the left might look great, but bringing that into real life, um, we just had that experience of understanding that um, the better translation will be the one on the right. And so one thing we started doing, this is an example of the piece in the gallery, um, and there was just a lot more impact with this piece where you might see, if let me go back, the one on the left, you might get a lot more um, hits on Instagram, but that doesn't always translate to something that you'll see tangible in the world. I, I have a lot of clients who are very well established museum grade artists where they might only get a couple of likes on Instagram compared to someone who might get 100,000 likes. Um, but there's a difference between something that you see viewing on a screen compared to physically on a wall. And that's something to always keep in mind as photographers, as artists, that you have to think about the final result of where it's gonna be hung and how it's gonna look hung instead of just on a screen because to be uh, most of us are working on screens that are much, much smaller than the actual final output. Um, so David, I'd like to keep you on here. Um, yeah, Joseph, if you kind of look back on that, that one slide where you have the comparison, yeah. the one on the right is, is true to the situation when we took the uh, shot. The one on the left is not. And what actually was a setup <clears throat> we were experimenting with for dye transfer, which is a heavy color mm -hmm. transfer. And so that you're absolutely right, kind of being able to see the differences and work it out with you was critical to getting uh, the right configuration for printing on aluminum. Yeah, and one thing that, um, and I, I really uh, encourage everybody to do this, is get feedback from people you trust, but people who will be very honest with you about uh, your artwork, about what you want to produce. Um, it's always good to get a, a handful of people. One thing we do here, um, I have a, a, a employee here, Mary Varr, who helps me out. She worked in a gallery setting, so I always like to get her feedback on when we're doing exhibitions like David's to make sure that I'm not looking at something that uh, I might have missed something. So that's very important to get other people's feedback. Uh, so when we're collaborating with artists, one of the biggest things we like to do is understand the, the purpose of it. Uh, is it going to be in a gallery setting? Is it going to be in a public space? Or is it going into a collector's home? So one thing David and I did when we were talking about going on dye sublimation and the finish, we wanted, I talked to David about going on a matte surface instead of a gloss. And David, you are used to going on a gloss with acrylic, correct? Correct. So, you know, that was one thing. And the reason being is, you know, in our gallery setting here, we have a lot of natural light. We have gallery lighting, but during the day, we have a lot of natural light. And it can be overwhelming if you had a gloss finish. So it's very important to get an understanding when you're working with a printmaker 
on what's the end purpose of the piece, where is it gonna be hung? Um, if it's in a gallery setting, they might have corrective lighting. If it's in a collector's home, 90% of the time, 90% uh, of the time they're not gonna have corrective lighting and it might be unlit. So you always have to keep that in mind when you're editing your files. Um, and one thing I wanna talk about is the importance of why David would use a phase one in terms of printmaking. Um, and the biggest thing is getting native resolution from the camera, from the camera sensor, rather than artificial resolution. So one thing that working with David's files, we didn't have to have that discussion on how large we could go um, because every file was, was really top notch. So we didn't get any artificial noise coming in. Um, one thing I've seen a lot of people do is get softwares for resampling and upsizing. Uh, just keep in mind, there's a lot of softwares out there. I've tried almost every single one. We use Photoshop when we have to do it, um, but they're always artificially uh, adding pixels. And whether they're smoothing out the image or they're, adding, they're sharpening the image or a combination of both, um, it's artificial and it's not true. So one thing that we really like as a printmaking company working with phase one cameras, you have a lot more flexibility, not only in size, but adjustments where you might not see digital artifacts come through. So this is a perfect example of the same image here. Um, gives you a perfect example of shot with a phase one. And then here's a close up of it at crop 4872 at 300 DPI. And you can just see the resolution that's there. And David, how far away were you from taking this shot approximately? Probably about 100 feet. 100 feet. Yeah, so 100 feet taking this shot. And then having that resolution where I don't have to call the artist and say, hey, we can't go 4872. We're going to have to go much smaller. Now, here's an example of a, a shot I took um, a couple years back on a Sony A6300. I was just out and about in Providence, Rhode Island. And this is the shot at 4872. Uh, definitely download this PDF after, guys, and look at it at 100%. But there's a lot of digital artifacts happening here. So my limitation on going something this size is, you know, I could do it, but you're going to start seeing a lot of digital artifacts. And those are really hard to get rid of. You can do it by smoothing out the image, but then you're going to lose all that detail. And someone like me who shoots, I'm all about detail. So something like this, if I smoothed it out, it wouldn't have the impact that I was going for. Now, when it, the only time we see uh, noise work is from the traditional way, not digital, not digital noise, but uh, analog noise. So this is shots from Robert Farber called the torso. And there's a lot of, but this is, this is real grain. This is not artificial grain. So that's when we, we see it's acceptable to do something larger. Um, but from today's cameras, digital cameras, the grain is just is artificial, doesn't look really good uh, when you actually produce it large. Because you also have to keep in mind, uh, people are going to view this not only from 10 feet away, 4 feet away, but people like to get up close and engage with the artwork. So if there are resolution issues, people will pick up on that, especially since nowadays everybody is so... Um, photography driven, you know, with Instagram and all that. So when they see it in person, they really want to experience it and go up close. So one of the things that we did with David after we did the printmaking was decide on framing. Um, and one thing I wanted to do with David's work, he had a body of uh, a collection of work from New Zealand and I wanted the images to speak for themselves. So one thing we like to do is focus on the artwork and do simple framing. I'll show you a piece right here. We did everything in a simple natural wood, it's tough to see the wood grain here, uh, floater frame. We do a lot of floater frames now, less of ornate framing, because we want the frame not to overpower the image. We want it to just be there to one, protect it, um, but also just to encase the imagery so it looks presentable. Um, and one thing I want to do is keep it very consistent. So when you look at uh, after this, I'll show you guys some product shots. Uh, but when you look at everything together, uh, the framing is, is consistent, so the focus is all on the imagery. Uh, we like to consult with artists, make sure that that's what they're focused on when they're doing a body of work. Here's a good example of the gallery uh, in all the pieces in a simple black wood frame. 
um, that really just encase the imagery and keep your focal point on the artwork itself. So one thing we also do too that was really unique with David's work um, is we do finishing, we do back sublimation. So, you know, David sent us his certificate of authenticity, which was really nice that we attached to the back. And then let me see if I can get this closer. And then we actually sublimated his signature and information on the piece. So what's really nice about that is we can work with artists around the world and around the country and embed their signature, send them a copy for proof, but then we can drop ship right to their clients. So that way there's no double shipping. You know, we ship it to the artist, he signs it, he or she signs it, and then sends it to the collector. There's only one, it's produced for, by us, sublimated, uh, everything's attached to the back, and then uh, delivered to the client. Um, the back sublimation is completely 100% customizable. Uh, this is an example of the piece I have right here. Um, so this is the first of the edition. David also added um, a sticker. Where did you get those stickers, David? Hanemiel. Yeah, Hanemiel makes those. Um, and it's a unique identifier um, to put on there. The nice thing about this back sublimation too is what we had trouble with, the, the one thing that we don't like about the metal is it's very hard to sign the front of. Um, it's really tough to, unless you use a paint marker and let it dry, it's tough to actually sign. So embedding it in doing a uh, back sublimation embeds it right into the surface. Here's another example from an artist, Hal Pruitt. Um, and this is embedded, you can't get rid of it. You can't get it off of the back. So if you guys have any more questions, I didn't want to run too uh, long. Um, feel free to reach out to me after this. And if there's any questions right now, I'm happy to answer some. I'll present to you a great, great piece of Oh, Lance, we lost you. Great presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, here are some of the questions. Let me just uh, scroll to see where they are. Here we go. What um, what PPI do you suggest is the same yeah. for die sub and inkjet? So it's, I will tell you every substrate is different. Uh, most printmakers like to say 300 DPI uh, to set the image to. Uh, that is uh, kind of a simplification of things. I We like to print at 300 DPI for die sub. That being said, we have been able to print stuff that maybe not have the resolution that we'd like at 150. Um, I can tell you watercolor paper, um, because of the tooth of it, you can, 200 is ideal. Canvas is actually at 150. We always like to print the highest resolution as possible. Since we're not a, uh, we're a very boutique lab, we're not trying to do a lot, a lot of fast output. We run these printers as slow as possible. So if the image has the resolution, and the DPI will print it as large as it comes in at. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Um, which of the printing methods offers the widest color gamut? So out of our, there's a lot of different printing methods. Ours is all inkjet based. Uh, technically our inkjet uh, printing onto photographic paper will give you the largest gamut. That, that being said, said when it comes to dye sublimation, we're able to get deep, since we're using dyes, not pigments, we're able to get deeper and darker blacks, reds, blues. Um, so it might have technically a smaller gamut, yet you can get more deeper and richer colors in certain uh, regards. Okay, great. How about, let's see this question. Why does dye sub versus face mount on acrylic? Yeah, that's a great question. I get that question literally every day. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, we do do face mounting onto acrylic, one, it's a little bit more expensive just because of the nature of the materials. And actually during the pandemic, everybody in the world is using acrylic for face shields uh, at stores and all that. Um, but the biggest thing is that we have a lot of clients in gallery settings where they're moving artwork around and acrylic tends to scratch. If anybody's ever experienced it, it they get really so, uh, surface scratches, little ones. But when you're trying to sell something for thousands of dollars, uh, when a client picks up on that, a, cli a collector picks up on that, you have to figure out who's gonna pay the bill and where did the scratch come from? And it gets very muddy. Is it the printmaker? Is it the gallery? Is it the artist who has to pay for it? Um, the nice thing about the aluminum, especially the matte finish here 
I'll show you, and people get scared that I do this. I can go like this, and I'm not scratching the surface. Yeah, David, don't worry. If I, if I do, I'll, I'll replace it. But you really don't have to worry about it when it comes to dye sub, especially the matte finish. The matte finish, the way it's uh, created, apparently matte finishes have just a more durable surface than, say, a gloss finish. So that's one of the biggest reasons we like it. Um, and all, another reason is weight. Acrylic is very heavy when you go large. So if you're using quarter inch acrylic, doing a 4872, you're upwards of 150 pounds compared to metal where I could do it for 30 pounds. Plus I've heard, isn't there warping sometimes associated with that when there's temperature changes and the humidity? Yeah, so the bigger, we actually have uh, acrylic panels up on our mezzanine here in the gallery and it gets direct sunlight and the, you, can, you can see it in, in higher heat when it's getting direct sunlight in the summertime, they start warping. Now, aluminum does expand and contract as well. Every, most every substrate does. The nice thing is it's actually built and manufactured to expand because the way you sublimate is with heat. Um, so when it gets in the summer months and it does expand, it expands evenly and then comes back in cooler, you know, in cooler climates. Yeah, and there's no adhesives or anything in between. Here, no, so. no, it, there's no laminate. And that's another thing with, with face mounting. You have to use a, a clear laminate. You know, you can get it just like any anything. You can get just bad rolls of laminate. You might not know it's bad uh, where you might get a little micro air bubble. And over time, it gets larger. But you might not notice it for years. But the, the client has it up. Ten years later, they're calling you for a new one. Right. Um, so that can be difficult if it's not done 100 percent correct. Okay. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, this one is the cost of dye sub, you know, a, a ballpark. Yeah. That you're gonna... Yeah, let's see. So uh, a 40 by 60 is around, hold on, let me just get out my calculator. We're not gonna hold this 40 cool. 60 is our average size. It's it's about 700 and change, all said and done, if you were to ready to hang. Okay. Um, so we do $42 a square foot. And if, you, if you're doing a big project, let us know. We can always work with you on maximizing aluminum and eliminating waste. Um, do you work with wedding photographers? We do. Yeah, we work with, you know, it's interesting, you know, yes, we are in the fine art world and we primarily work with artists who are full time. But that being said, we work with, I work with a lot of high end wedding uh, photographers, um, who use the service for, you know, someone like a, the parents want to get a nice uh, couple of images, maybe not as large as David's work right here, because that'd be a, a little bit too big, but uh, smaller size, we do it all the time. So we work, you know, we're unique where we work in any capacity. Um, if you're looking for prints, it doesn't have to be in a gallery setting, it doesn't have to be to a collector, it can be just for personal use. I just had a couple in here today that bought a piece of artwork and then they want to get some of their own imagery done. So happy to help. Yeah, that's great. You know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, Blazing is a, is a great company. They take pride in working with you on an individual basis, you know, versus some of the other companies that are out there where it's just a production room and they just ship stuff out. So um, we have two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, sure. How durable are your ceramic tiles? Would you use them on floors? So, yes, we do offer ceramic tiles and they're sublimated. Uh, we can get durable ones for the floors. Um, one thing to keep in mind, we offer that that's more for corporate world. The world. It is not. Um, there has been no testing for the, for, by the manufacturer or third party on archivability. So if you're looking for something for longevity in terms of color, I'd advise going on aluminum or a photographic paper. Uh, rather than going on tile. Tile is more for just commercial uh, installations like mosaics and all that. But yes, uh, we can get some in for walking. And then uh, I'll put a final question for you. And then I have one more question for you, David. So brushed aluminum, do you offer that? Yeah, we offer all the, it's all uh, manufactured by Chromalux, Universal Woods in Louisville, Kentucky. We have the clear finishes as well. Uh, we always like to consult with anybody who's going to use it because not every image looks well with the clear aluminum. Uh, just so you guys know that this metal actually comes in when it doesn't have an image on it, it comes in white. Um, but we do get metal that comes in um, just clear. It's just straight raw aluminum. The thing, keep in mind, though, we don't print with white. So anything, if the image has a lot of white in it or light areas, it's going to turn metallic. Um, so not every image works well. Um, doing it, but yes, we yeah, can do and it. some images work better with it than others, but 
Yeah, we have great examples on our website. If you go through it, uh, we have a lot of portfolios and examples of people using it in the right fashion. Okay, great. Thank you, Joseph. This last question will be for uh, David. <clears throat> David, uh, when you focus using a tech hammer, do you use IQ's Live View Focus, Focus Mask, or combination of? How do you achieve your critical focus? Yeah, probably uh, both, but I have to tell you, it, it's all kind of site uh, uh, specific uh, in that regard. You can try a whole host of techniques, but the best technique is pull it up on a back, <coughs> take the shot, <coughs> increase cool. the size of the image, see whether you've uh, got it. Right, take exactly. time on, on the, and so you can utilize all kinds of uh, short tricks to try and get yourself there, but the tried and true is actually take the shot, pull it up on the camera, expand the size of the image, target the areas you want to get uh, tack sharp, and then you'll see whether or not you actually accomplished it. One mm -hmm. thing before you get off, uh, I did want to give a lot of credit to Joseph and Blazing Editions. It's it, just not a printer. It's a relationship. Absolutely. Uh, these people really put themselves out. Uh, there's a lot of interchange. Uh, there's a lot of discussion. Uh, in, uh, there's an opportunity to take uh, their well thought out criticism uh, to heart in terms of how you approach things. And so uh, they take uh, an approach here, which I'm very comfortable with, which is more of a relationship, just not a printer. I get a lot of credit, Joseph, to you and your Appreciate team that. in terms of how you carried on the activity and support of my artwork. Yeah, one thing to add on that, I appreciate that, David, um, is if anybody ever does work with us, we are not a company where you just upload a fo uh, file and never interact with anybody. Uh, there's not one piece of artwork that we've ever produced where we never got someone, at least on the phone. Um, we just don't operate that way. So when it comes to printing, there's no way of automating everything to get exact in color and get what you want right. Um, so there are a lot of online photo labs um, that can work for certain situations, but when it comes to something like this and creating really large scale artwork, uh, you just need to be able to interact and build a relationship to make sure everyone's on the same page and we do the best product possible. Yeah, and it does come down to relationships. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate many years ago to meet your father, Joseph and much relationship yeah. with him. And then, you know, I met you and throughout the years and felt very comfortable in introducing my clients to you because I know that they'd be in great hands. And um, yeah. that, that's one of the other things that Digital Transitions does. And that's what I touched on earlier. It's the relationship, putting it all together, introducing people and creating the community. And uh, I want to thank you both for being part of this. And I'm very proud of the work that you're both doing. And uh, yeah. it's great and keep it up. Yeah, thanks for having no, us. Our pleasure. Thank you. Our pleasure. And everyone, uh, afterwards you'll be receiving an email follow-up that will have the link to the replay of this particular uh, webinar, but also a link to a survey that if you could just take a few minutes, fill it out, it really helps us to build our programming for the future and you know refocus our efforts to help you better. And again, I appreciate everyone who attended and I thank you both. And also Arnob and Kate, great job. Yeah, and everybody get a chance to look at David's, uh, we have a YouTube walkthrough. I don't know if you all see the link. Mm -hmm. Definitely walk, uh, click on that video and, and experience David's work in our gallery here. Uh, I wish everybody could see it in person, but it's really impactful here. Yeah, and contact us at DT if you'd like to have a virtual demo or learn more about any of these systems. And um, have a great day, everyone, and be safe. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Take care.